Hi everyone, welcome to STAT254 tutorial week 9. Today's video is going to be about hypothesis tests for the mean. So hypothesis tests for the mean are the only hypothesis tests that you look at in this class. Um, if you take statistics later on, then you can do hypothesis tests for any parameter. So for instance, sigma. But um, just so we're clear, this is for the mean, and let's dive in. It's going to be broken down into two parts. First, we'll look at the hypothesis test intuition. Hopefully that will clear some things up. And then we'll go into a hypothesis test calculations. And I'll give you a step-by-step -step method for solving hypothesis tests using p-values. In the next video, I'll do something on using test statistics to determine whether or not to reject an idle hypothesis. But in this video, we will focus on using p-values. So we start with the intuition. Hypothesis testing. Why do we need them? Let's start with an example. And I'm going to use a marketing example that's going to change slightly over the course of the video, but it's going to be the basis for how we're going to learn about hypothesis testing. And I'd like to make a point that this video, you are meant to have seen all the videos leading up, especially the most recent video about um, standard normal distributions. And so this isn't meant to be the absolute first introduction to hypothesis testing, but I do start from a pretty basic level and hopefully it helps out. Say we own a social media marketing company. For years now, we've had a system called IG Grow One that when clients sign up for it, the number of Instagram followers that they have grows on average by 250 followers per week. Then one day, our head of research approaches us and says that based on recent sampling, IG Grow One actually increases clients' Instagram followers by 330 per week, not the 250 that we've been advertising. So the question is, should we start advertising that our system grows followers by 330 per week? The answer to this question is, we don't have enough information to make an informed decision. And to think about that, consider the following. What if our researcher sample size was two clients? So say he, has, he, he took two different clients, one of which maybe goes up by 260 on average per week, but the other client goes up by 500 per week. When we're doing hypothesis testing and we want to answer questions like, should we change our beliefs? We need to incorporate information about the sample size because otherwise people could be pulling the wool over our heads using, you know, selecting, making sand, uh, samples that aren't random, collecting only one or two people for a sample, Obviously, that doesn't give us enough information. Another thing to consider, what if IG Grow One has a standard deviation of sigma equals 150 followers per week? That would mean that we expect 250 as the mean, but that mean averages, even in just one standard deviation, 150 per week, right? So there's a huge difference between say, a standard deviation of 30 and a standard deviation of 150. We also need to incorporate that information. So we need this systematic way to, com to compare the two methods. The first method being what we've always believed, and this new idea being that our followers have gone up. We need to use a hypothesis test. Okay. So, hypothesis tests, we start with a null hypothesis. And we think about the null hypothesis as the status quo. It's what we believed is true thus far. We think about this as the population as we know it. And for our case here, the mean, average increase in followers per week, is equal to 250. That's what we've always thought. That's what is our status quo, that is our default belief, and therefore that is our null hypothesis. 
and we need to write it in mathematical form. So here I've said h naught, h sub 0, we pronounce that h naught. And I've said mu, the sub ig subscript there, that just means Instagram. So we say mu equals 250. That's our null hypothesis. And then we need an alternative hypothesis. This is what our new idea is. This is, we've hypothesized that our mean is different from 250. In fact, we've hypothesized that it's greater than 250. And so we would say the mean average increase in followers per week is greater than 250. We represent the alternative hypothesis with HA, and we say that mu is greater than 250. A note here is that you never want equality in the alternative hypothesis, right? We want to make a decision. So it wouldn't be correct to say greater than or equal to 250. We say greater than, because if it equals 250, then we wouldn't change our belief. And the last piece is, I like to think about it that often we are hoping to reject the null hypothesis. This may be considered slightly incorrect, but in general, we've come up with something. We have a new idea, and we're trying to test it to see if we're right. So often you could think about it as the null is the status quo that we've had for a long, long time. We've come up with a new idea, we've implemented our idea, and we see if we have enough statistical evidence to overturn that null hypothesis. All right, so we said that our alternative hypothesis is that mu is greater than 250. Hypothesis tests can fall into three categories. This one, because we have greater than, is called a right-tailed test. Okay, so it's greater than, therefore we're looking for things on the right-hand side of the normal curve. We call it a right-tailed test. Now, suppose that the head of research told us that their sampling showed an average increase of only 150 per week. So not 330, but in fact less than what we've been advertising. In that case, a reasonable alternative hypothesis would have been that HA means that mu is less than 250, right? It wouldn't make sense to do some sampling, realize that in our sample, the mean is 150, and then do a right-tailed test to see if it's greater than 250. So if the situation was a little different, and we had a sample that showed 150, then we would ask, we would set up our alternative hypothesis as mu is less than 250. We call this a left-tailed test. So whichever, whichever direction the inequality sign is pointing, that's what we call the test. Here it's pointing to the left, it's a left-tailed test. Here it's pointing to the right, it's a right-tailed test. So there's a third option as well, and that is what we call a two-tailed test. So we're saying that mu is not equal to 250. It could be a little less, it could be a little more. We're just saying we're not sure and we want to spread our doubt on both sides of the normal distribution. So this one is the one that tends to cause a little bit of confusion, but when you, for your worries, aka your midterm, what you want to keep in mind is that you use the wording of the question to decide which it is. If the question says that we want to see if the true mean is greater than 250, then we do a right tail test. If the question says we want to test the hypothesis that the true mean is not 250, then you do a two-tailed test. All right? So 
Let's say history has shown us that the amount of IG Grow One increases Instagram followers is normally distributed with a mean of mu mean mu of 250, which is the same thing that we've said. And now we also know that it has a standard deviation of 35, right? So I've drawn drawn a normal curve here. Note it's not a standard normal curve because we don't have mean zero, we have mean 250, and we don't have standard deviation of one, we have standard deviation of 35. And I'm gonna use this to try and demonstrate what we mean about using a bell curve to understand hypothesis testing. So, for instance, this was a perfectly normal distribution, which we're saying it's at least approximate to, then the empirical rule shows us that if we take one standard deviation on each side, so we go, what's the probability that the true mean, that the that our mean is between 215 and 285, well, we know that's 68%, right? So think about this, as I showed in the last video, where we have a normal distribution and the area underneath the curve between any two points on the horizontal axis gives us how much probability is for that area, right? Okay, simple. So, we have our past knowledge. That's a, this null hypothesis, this status quo is that the true mean is 250 with standard deviation 35. Say we now have, from our recent sampling, like we mentioned before, that X bar is equal to 330, so much higher than what we believe the mean to be. So here we've drawn where 330 is on the bottom right of this curve, right? So we're saying that we expect, because it's a normal distribution, for most of the probability to be within one to two standard deviations, right? That's where the bulk of this area is. Way off in the corner here is 330. So because it's such in such a low little area on the curve, it doesn't have much probability at all. And so if we also said that in our sample, we had a sample standard deviation of 50, and we drew a sample of 40 people. While just looking at the curve, we can tell that this is a pretty unlikely outcome. It's way over on the right here, this 330. We'd be much more likely to see something, say, 265, right? Maybe 225. So our question is, what is the probability that in a random sample, we would end up with X bar being 330 or more based on the fact, given the fact, that we believe the null hypothesis, which is that the true mean is 250 with standard deviation 35. So given that we believe that's the distribution that holds most of its probability in the center here, what would be the probability of seeing something 330 or more? Well, that's what we call the p-value. Now, this definition of p-value is something that really throws students off because it seems like a mambo-jambo bunch of words that don't really make any sense. But it's super important to try and dig through this and understand what it means because it allows you to create a framework in your brain that diminishes the amount of memory you need to do. If you can truly understand what's behind the p-value, you can sit in front of a question and make decisions without having to memorize every single little slogan or formula. So the p-value definition is, the p-value is the probability of seeing a result at least as extreme as those observed given the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so the probability of seeing a result at least as extreme as those observed. So 
we observed a mean in our sample of 330. So it wouldn't make sense if we're saying that at least as extreme as, 100, as 330, well, we're obviously not looking, you know, less than 330. We care about the probability of greater than 330. We care about this tiny bit of piece of probability in yellow here, okay? So that's the part that at least as extreme as those observed. If we were doing a left tail test and say we had a, our sampling showed that the mean was 180, well then as least as extreme would be 180 or less. Oh, and I've made a mistake on my, my plot here. That should say, uh, that should not say 180 there. My apologies. So the, if we had a left tail test, at least as extreme would be less than 180. Okay. So the p-value, oh, and the last part here, is given that the null hypothesis is true. So this piece is where our distribution comes in. Because we're always choosing the distribution given the null hypothesis is true, the null hypothesis tells us that we believe we are dealing with a distribution with a mean of 250 and a standard deviation of 35, right? It's not just the probability that x would be great, greater than 330. We care about, given that we think the mean is 250 with standard deviation 35, what's the probability that our sampled mean x bar is greater than 330? Right, so this gives us this little area to the right. And if we calculate it, we find that the answer is, the p-value is 2.27 times 10 to the negative 24, which is an exceedingly small number. So it would be absolutely insane for us to do, a, to collect a sample of 40 people, get an X bar of 330, given that our null hypothesis is true, given that we believe the true mean to be 250 or sigma to be 35. So it's saying the fact that we got a mean of 330 means that it's very unlikely that our belief about the past where mu was 250 is true. This would only happen almost none of the time. We're talking, this is such a small number that it's unbelievable. Therefore, the fact that it happened, the fact that we did this sampling and we got those numbers is extraordinarily rare and shows that the thing that must be wrong must be that H0 is not true, right? Because it would be so unlikely for us to get an x-bar of 330, given the null hypothesis is true, that kind of tells us the null hypothesis that we had probably isn't true. And that's the basis of the p-value and how it works with hypothesis testing. No, I went on a little bit there, but it's super important to think about it that way. Okay, what would a different sample look like? Say instead that our recent sample shows that we have an x-bar of 330, so it's still the same situation there, but this time we have a sample standard deviation of 150, and we only took a sample of 5. Well, even though the mean, this sampled mean x bar is still at 330, based on the fact that we now have s equals 150 and such a small sample size, the same calculation will give us a bigger p-value, right? So we're doing the same thing here. Probability that x bar is greater than 330, given the null hypothesis is true. But now, in our calculations, we're going to incorporate this small sample size, and it's going to give us a different result.
So by changing the sample size and having a sample standard deviation of 150, we get the probability that x bar being greater than 330 is 0.1495. Now for those of you who um, are very good at this sort of thing, you'll note that 0.1495 is not the probability you get from the z distribution, it's actually from the t distribution. Don't worry about that right now. We're focusing on the general ideas behind hypothesis testing in this right now. And the point of this slide is to show that even if we keep the mean the same, changing the number or the size of the sample and S, the, the um, sample standard deviation, can have an effect. So now we're saying that 15% of the time we would expect to do a sample and get a mean of 330 if we only sample five people or five clients. It's not that unlikely, therefore kind of gives us a little more strength of belief in our null hypothesis. Okay, so the p-value. What p-value do we need to reject the null hypothesis? We've kind of shown what a p-value is, but you know, we would think that something times 10 to the negative 24 is probably a low enough p-value to reject the null hypothesis. But is 15%? And what we need is an alpha to compare it to. So alpha is the probability of a type 1 error. Now, in the previous slide, the little yellow area down to the right, I was pointing out as the p-value, right? It's this at least as extreme area as some number. Now, alpha also, in a right-tailed test, lives in this area. And alpha is the thing we compare the p-value to. It's the amount of uncertainty that we're willing to deal with. So the scientist would come up with this and say, I'm willing to deal with an alpha of blank. Now, remember that a type 1 error is the probability that we reject the null hypothesis given that the null hypothesis is true. Now, this would be a mistake, right? That's why alpha is the amount of error we're willing to deal with. We're saying Whatever we set alpha it at, that's the amount, say we set alpha at 0 0.05, which is often used, that is the amount of probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis we're willing to deal with. Okay? Alpha is often called the rejection region. So if our p-value lies in this alpha here, meaning that the probability is less than alpha, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. Like I said, alpha is often equal to 0 0.05. And now the rule is, if the p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. That is what you're looking for to make your determination p-value less than alpha, reject the null hypothesis. The way I like to remember it is a dorky little slogan. If the p-value is low, the null's got to go. All right? If the p-value is low, the null's got to go. If the p-value is lower than alpha, reject the null hypothesis. So that's the end of our intuition here. And now we're going to move on to calculation. Let's tweak the example once again. So now we have this past knowledge, our mean is still 250, and we have a population standard deviation of 40. Okay. And our recent sample shows X bar is equal to 260. So, you know, a lot closer to mu, but still a little bit higher. We do a sample standard deviation, and we find that that is equal to 40, and our sample size is 35. 
question becomes, do we have enough evidence to say the true mean increase in number of Instagram followers is greater than 250 with 95% confidence? And so this 95% confidence, you will see, that's how we figure out our alpha. Alpha is always one minus the level of confidence you want. So if we want to be 95% confident that there isn't a type one error, AKA that we don't reject a true null hypothesis, then there's 5% chance that we will. So one minus 0.95 would give us an alpha of 0 0.05. Okay, so what are the steps? Give me some steps, Steve. First step, we write out the null and alternative hypotheses in mathematical notation. We've already seen how to do that. We will go over it slightly deeper again. Second step, determine the proper test to use. For you, right now we're only dealing with the Z test or the T test. We will come to proportions, and obviously there are many, many, many tests out there. But generally for a first year statistics class, or second year statistics class, the first time you take statistics, we're dealing with the Z test or the T test. And that is the case for STAT254. Third step, we calculate the test statistic and alpha. Fourth step, we calculate the p-value. And I'm saying if necessary, because there is a way to do hypothesis testing without the p-value. We're going to cover that in the next video. Finally, write your conclusion. I've seen so many students lose marks based on doing all this work and then never writing out a proper conclusion to the hypothesis test. Okay, so let's start with step one. Put our past knowledge and our recent sampling up at the top. We want to write out the null and alternative hypotheses in mathematical notation. So like we said, the null hypothesis, H0, is that mu is equal to 250. That's what we've always believed. Our alternative hypothesis, like we said, is mu is greater than 250. Notice that we don't say anything about 260, which is our x bar. We are just, our decision is based on, is the mean greater than 250? We use 260 in the calculation, but when we're setting up our alternative hypothesis, it is always going to be less than, greater than, or not equal to what we believe our mean is. Okay, now we need to determine the proper test to use. The way I like to think about it is we want to use the Z test. The Z test uses the normal distribution. The T test uses the T distribution. Because of the way the tables are set up that you use, the T test provides a range of p-values. But the Z test gives us a pretty close approximation to an actual value. And it's easier to use the Z test. But we need to meet certain assumptions if we want to use the Z test. So those are, the population must be approximately normal. So in the question, it's going to have to say something comes from approximately normal distribution, or uh, this distribution is approximately normal. This will almost always be the case. We must have a random sample. This just means that we have to do our sampling properly. This often isn't even mentioned in courses like this because we just assume all samples are random and that we've sampled properly. We didn't pick and choose which clients based on the fact that this client grows way quicker than others. We have to do a, a blind random sampling. And we need to know the population standard deviation sigma. So if sigma is provided, then we can use the normal distribution. Or if we don't have sigma, as long as our sample size is greater than or equal to 30, we can um, use the Z test. Okay? So 
for our particular example, we said that the comes from a normal population, so we've got that. It's implied that we have a random sample, because there wouldn't be any hypothesis test to do if we didn't take a proper random sample. And we need to know the population standard deviation, which we do, and we also have a sample size greater than 30, right? We have n equals 35. So we've checked all our boxes. We get to use the Z test. Now we're on to step three. Calculate the test statistic. We calculate the observed test statistic, TS observed, so TS for test statistic. We generally write Z observed or T observed, depending on whether or not we're using a Z test or a T test. And the test statistic is the statistic that's measuring what our sample tells us, right? Comparing it to our belief about the null hypothesis. So we have our past knowledge. We have our recent sampling. We also have that our confidence level was told us in the question is 0.95. Okay. So if we want to calculate Z observed, we start off very similarly or exactly to the video last time about converting to a standard normal distribution, right? The idea here is that we are converting to a standard normal distribution so that we can make comparisons of whether or not our true mean is 250. So when we standardize a variable, we take its mean, or we take that, we take that variable and subtract its mean, right? So in this case, we're dealing with x bar. And so the next part is the part that's changed from when we were dealing with just x. So the last video we were talking about normal distributions, standardizing um, a distribution that isn't a standard normal to begin with. And here we have, this time we're using x bar. And because we're using x bar, our denominator is different. Our denominator is called the standard error of the mean. So all that is, is we take our standard deviation, right? From the last video, we wouldn't have this divided by square root n here. Everything else would be the same. But because we have, we're dealing with x bar, and we're talking about means, we now have to divide by what's called the standard error of the mean. It's the standard deviation of the sampling mean, okay? So just remember, that's what we have to divide by. And now, if we weren't given sigma, so we are told that sigma equals 40, but if we weren't, because our sample size is greater than or equal to 30, we would be able to use S here instead of sigma. Just pointing that out. And so now all we got to do is fill in our numbers, right? X bar is 260, the mean is 250, we divide by the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, and we get that our z observed is 1.48. And now we have to calculate alpha, which is generally the easiest thing that you have to do in statistics. We have an alpha, we have a confidence level of 0.95, so our alpha is just 1 minus 0.95, right? Alpha equals 1 minus the confidence level. Okay, so we finished our third step. We have our Z observed, which is our test statistic, is 1.48 and an alpha of 0.05. Now we want to calculate the p-value. Once again, I've pointed out if necessary. I'll just say a quick little thing about that. We can determine whether or not to reject the null hypothesis by comparing the test statistic to the critical value. Don't worry about those words right now because the next video is that's what we're going to go over. We're going to go over the non-p-value method for making conclusions in a hypothesis test. So, calculating the p-value. We have all our past knowledge, our recent sampling, we have our test statistic, we know our alpha as well. 
The p-value depends on what style of test we're doing. The test we're doing in this example is a right-tailed test. Remember we discussed that at the beginning. We're looking at comparing mu to mu naught. And I've thrown in this notation here because it's, it's something you'll see a lot. And when we look at this, we think mu, our alternative hypothesis is that mu, we think about that as the true mean, is that mu is greater than the mu we think we have. So here, the mu on the left is this idea of what the actual truth is out there. And mu naught is what we currently have you know, in our records as what the mean is. Okay, So just lots of notation with hypothesis testing. As long as you have an understanding of little bits of it, then you can get used to seeing questions that are presented in many different ways. Right, And so this is a right-tailed test. So we have our rejection region over to the right. Because we're considering, is the true mean greater than what we believe the mean to be? So our uncertainty is on the right. So the way we can calculate this, and if this doesn't make sense to you, make sure you go back to the video from last week about standardizing normal distributions. We have the probability that our random variable z is greater than our z observed, which is 1.48. And because we use the tables, we always have to have, we always have to look up values for less than or equal to. So we have greater than, we go one minus that, one minus less than or equal to, so that it's the same thing as calculating greater than, plug in our z observed, look up on the table, and we get that we have a p-value of 0 0.0694. What if it wasn't a right-tailed test? What if it was a left-tailed test? then we would be thinking, is the true mean less than the 250 we've come to believe? Our uncertainty would be on the left-hand side of the graph. And this is the easiest one to look up because there's no adjusting of signs. The probability that z is less than z observed is the exact same thing as the probability of z less than or equal to z observed because it's a continuous distribution, and we would calculate our p-value that way. Now the third way is the tricky way. This is the two-tailed test. So remember this is where we say the true mean is simply not equal to the mean that we believe. It could be less, it could be more, we just don't think it's equal. So here we split up our probability or our alpha, our you know rejection regions to the left and the right. We spread out our alpha. If our alpha was 0 0.05, that would mean we'd have 2.5% over here in area and 2.5% over here. This will be explained more in the next video because this plays an important role in calculating when you're not using a p-value. Okay. So for a two-tailed test, the probability becomes the probability that z is not equal to z observed is two times the probability that z is greater than z observed or two times the probability that z is less than z observed. Now the difference is key and you'll get the question wrong if you don't understand which to use but let's think about it for a second. If we're calculating, if we said we had an alpha of 0.05, so that means we've spread 2.5 of it here and 2.5 of it here. When we calculate a p-value, we're only looking at one side, right? So that's why whether we're looking at this side or this side, we need to multiply that p-value by two to properly compare it to alpha. Now, like I said, whether you use the probability that z is greater than or the probability that z is less than is key here. You have to use the correct one. The idea being that if your x bar is greater than, 
Well, then you're going to be using a right tail test. So our x bar is bigger than our mu, so we're looking on the right hand side. Therefore, we would use the first option. If we sampled and found x bar to be 220, we would use the left hand option and multiply by 2. But there is a trick. And if you're having a hard time wrapping your head around the rest of this, the trick is this. Always use the second one. Always use 2 times the probability that z is less than or equal to z observed. And then just make sure your z observed is negative. If it's already negative, you don't have anything to do. But if you want to use this, if you want to do a two-tailed test, if you get a z observed that is positive, simply put a negative sign in front of it, calculate it, and multiply it by 2. I will always, always, always give you the correct answer. Okay, so we've calculated our p-value, and now it's down to writing the conclusion. Don't lose marks by forgetting your conclusion, okay? Too many times have I seen students get the exact right test statistic, the exact right p-value, then not put a conclusion, and depending on the instructor or the marker, lose, you know, at least a third of the marks. This is how a conclusion for our example should look. So, since the calculated p-value of 0 0.0694 is greater than alpha equals 0 0.05, we fail to reject the null hypothesis that the true mean increase in Instagram followers using IGGrow1 is 250 followers per week. So there's three key pieces in here. The first key is make sure you state what the p-value is and what alpha is. You want to say is it greater than or is it less than. So we state the p-value in alpha. The second piece is we need to state our decision. So here we either, the, the two decisions are we reject the null hypothesis or we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Those are our only two choices. Here, because p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So make sure you state your decision. And the last piece is state what that decision means. Write something that uses the words in the question to state what it actually means. If we just tell someone we fail to reject the null hypothesis, that might not mean a lot to them. This last piece is for maybe our boss in the company. The boss wants to know what is the decision. And the decision is that the true mean increase in Instagram followers using IG Grow 1 is 250 followers per week, right? That was our null hypothesis before. We don't have enough ed evidence to contradict that, and so we're sticking with our null hypothesis. Hopefully that all made sense. Next time, we'll do hypothesis tests without p-values. Cheers, everyone.